Hey everyone, good morning. Today we're joined by Dr. Sean Esplin, Senior Medical Director for Women's Health here at Intermountain Healthcare to give a COVID-19 update. Today's update is a little bit different than normal. We're going to be focusing specifically on the vaccine and women's health. We're going to be discussing some of the top questions we've received around the vaccine related to pregnancy, breastfeeding, and whether this vaccine or the vaccines that are available are safe. Dr. Esplin, thank you so much for joining us. It's nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So I would like to start with talking about the virus itself. Can you talk about what are some of the risks of someone who actually contracts COVID-19 who is actually pregnant? Yeah, so it turns out that we've learned a lot about the virus. We now have a lot of experience with it. And the more experience that we're gaining, we're finding that uh, people who become infected during pregnancy can actually have a little bit more severe course than uh, than someone who's not pregnant. So if you're pregnant and you, and you get the infection, you have a higher chance of needing help breathing because your lungs can be more infected, more affected. You might have a higher chance of being admitted to the hospital or the ICU, and even a higher chance of you know, having uh, a death because of this. And that's not unusual because um, we know that in, with other viral infections that uh, during, for example, just the, the regular flu, if you get that when you're pregnant, you can have a more severe course. So it makes sense that COVID might have the same type of, the same type of effect. So it's really important that pregnant women try to avoid, uh, you know, being being infected. It's interesting. I I was also, actually, me, sorry, go let, ahead. Let me just add to that. Sorry. I, I'd also say, you know, especially those people who have other medical conditions that put that put them at higher risk. So diabetes, um, high blood pressure, asthma, or being overweight. Those things in conjunction with being pregnant and having COVID really are a recipe for having a, you know, a, a high risk of a bad outcome. I was going to say too, it's, it's really interesting. I was watching back our first Facebook Live from last March and we talked uh -huh. about women specifically related to pregnancy and we did not have the data we obviously have now. What yeah. is one of the biggest things we've learned about women in COVID-19 in the last year? Well, I think number one, that the, the effect on pregnancy, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm more comfortable that the risk to the baby is actually maybe not as high as we were worried about initially, um, but uh, but I think we've learned that you can you can there are good ways to prevent this that just by doing the masking and the social distancing and and you know just good hand hygiene we can actually reduce this and we're learning that the vaccine is a huge part of the of how we prevent this and we're understanding now how to treat people and. And I think we're being a little bit more comfortable with, um, you know, the outcomes for babies at, at this point too. So let's talk a little bit about the vaccine. Uh, I, from my understanding, there was not a pregnancy involved in those clinical trials. I did find out later that some women were pregnant, but can you just talk to us about the benefits of actually receiving the vaccine while you're pregnant? Yeah. So that's another thing that we've really learned a lot about since you and I spoke last time. And you're right, the initial studies with the vaccines um, didn't, they tried not to include people who were pregnant. And that's one of the pro problems with these vaccine trials is that you, you really don't know how they're going to respond in pregnant women. Um, so right now, you know, right now we have uh, more than 50,000 women who are pregnant have received these vaccines. And, and we're following them very closely to make sure that we're not seeing any uh, increased risk of complications or other problems. And what to, to this point, there are no concerns that we're seeing among pregnant women to say, hey, there's a higher risk of the vaccine during pregnancy. So that's really reassuring. And you know, I, I actually am really impressed with the way this vaccine rollout has happened because uh, you know, if you've if you have uh, received your vaccine and you signed up to be tracked with the little app tracker that they have, they're asking you every day or every other day about your symptoms, right? And and so as and we we're specifically following pregnant women who have chosen to receive the vaccine and actually looking for looking at their medical records to make sure that that we're not seeing any problems. So we there's there's a lot of experience now, much more than before in pregnancy. And, the, and these vaccines seem to be safe. The other thing that we've done, which is really interesting, is that um, uh, they just published a study in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology where they looked at about 180 women who were pregnant and, and got the vaccine or who were breastfeeding and got the vaccine. 
vaccine. And they compared them to pregnant women who actually got the infection. And what they're showing is the vaccine actually creates a higher immune response. You're more protected if you've got the vaccine than if you had the natural, the natural uh, uh, COVID infection. So that's really awesome. We can show that that just like we expect, the vaccine produces the response that we want. And it's in levels that are much higher than if you'd, got, you'd gotten the, the infection yourself. And they've shown that those antibodies cross the placenta and actually get to the baby. Uh, and they also are in breast milk and get to babies that are breastfeeding. And you know we've always known that, um, that breastfeeding provides, it, it's really important for newborns to get antibodies from their mothers to have protection so we, you know, we, we offer immunizations during pregnancy. We offer the Tdap and we offer the, the influenza vaccine. And part of that is to protect the mother, but part of that is also protect the baby. So finding that these COVID uh, antibodies are, are reaching the baby means that if you want to be safe yourself in your pregnancy and you want to keep your baby as safe as possible with respect to COVID, get the vaccine and get it earlier. The earlier you get it in the pregnancy, the higher the levels that will get, that will get to your baby. So um, I think the data that are coming out right now are very reassuring that, um, that we don't see any unusual complications during pregnancy. And we're actually now have evidence that the vaccine is at least effective in producing an immune response and that that is reaching the baby as well. I know there are some reports, uh, I think it was around a month ago where the first baby was born that actually had the antibodies for COVID, which is really interesting to me. Do you know if stuff like that is being studied a little bit more? Are people who got you said that you're watch they're watching certain people who um, have received the vaccine. Are there studies happening around this group of people at all, or is it absolutely still they're act work? they're actively enrolling patients in in vaccine trials um, that are pregnant? Um, I just I mean this I hope this isn't too scientific for you, but I mean we've been we've been um, collecting placentas from patients who were, were infected to kind of see is the virus getting into the placenta, and what we're finding is really interesting. In fact, we're we're just about to 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 present our results that show that um, the virus can stick around for as long as eight weeks after your infection. We, we found a virus in people's placenta eight weeks from people who were infected eight weeks before. And what we're finding is that um, the immune response within the placenta is the thing that determines whether the virus sticks around or not. So we're really understanding more and more about this, this uh, condition during pregnancy. And uh, why or why not babies? I mean, I, there's clearly some people who, who are at higher risk of having the virus uh, get into the placenta and others who are not. And I think the next step for our studies is to try to figure out, uh, you know, how, what's, why some placentas are protected, protected and some are not. So there's a lot of research going on right now. Uh, you know, we're part of, at Intermountain, we're part of this um, uh, uh, multi-center trial where we're looking at just outcomes in pregnancy during the pandemic, and we're looking at outcomes of pregnancy in patients who have uh, who've had COVID, and and we're able to uh, get large enough numbers that we're going to be able to really understand it. It's a really interesting study. I appreciate you sharing that. So you you talked about the benefits of the vaccine. Are there any risks associated with this uh, group of people for getting the vaccine itself? So you know, I think that's a really good question right now. Um, uh, what you need to understand is there are two different types of vaccines that are available. So there are, there are two vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna, that are mRNA based. That means when you get the, when you get the injection, um, what you're receiving is these little messages that are like the recipe that your cells can take up and they, they make the protein for a short period of time. It's a protein that comes from the virus. And that protein, when your body sees it, it recognizes it as, as foreign and it creates the immune response. So when you get that sore spot on your arm, you know, or when you feel tired or maybe you have a little fever after the, after the injection, that's the sign that your body's making an immune response and making antibodies. So there's the mRNA vaccines. And then there's the, the Johnson & Johnson, which is, which is uh, an attenuated adenovirus vaccine. So they're using a different way to get the information into the, into the body. So you have to think, when you're talking about complications, you have to think about those two different types. With mRNA vaccines, you know, we, we haven't seen a lot of risks. The real risks have been, you know, how you feel right after you get the injection. But we haven't seen, we haven't seen major complications with it. And we've had literally 
tens of millions of people, almost hundreds of millions of people across the, the globe that have received this now, and we're tracking it really closely. So I'm really comfortable with that. With that. Um, now, with the Johnson and Johnson, you know, they just had this pause, and uh, and I, I think it, that pause tells me that we're being transparent, that the system is working, that we're rolling out a vaccine and we got 7 million doses. And you really need, you know, millions of doses to kind of see some of these really infrequent problems that might arise. And, you know, what they, what they found with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is that, that um, in, in seven people out of 7 million, there was a certain type of blood clot that occurred. And, um, and it's, it's, we don't know yet whether that blood clot is, is actually tied to the vaccine, but there's enough concern that, that we, I think it's wise to kind of stop and look at the data and kind of, and, and reevaluate. So, I mean, this new, the new, um, the, the new information that we're getting now about the, the Johnson and Johnson is um, number one, it's good that we're, it shows that the tracking system is working. We're identifying any, any concerns and we're stopping and we're not just plowing ahead. We're stopping and kind of evaluating it. The problems that we're seeing are, are very infrequent. They're, it's one in a million, right? And if you look at the, you know, the, the number of lives that are saved by, by, by uh, vaccinating a million people, you know, the risk benefit ratio there actually still favors being, being uh, vaccinated. And then the last thing is, you know, this, this understanding what this risk is and how to watch for it and how to treat it is, is important. So this, uh, this is an opportunity for us to kind of get that information before we, before we go, go forward. Those, those, I will say this, the Johnson & Johnson, um, we haven't seen a problem in pregnant patients. Um, you know, it, it, they, they did occur more frequently in women. And the women, um, the women that, um, that uh, women are just more likely to form blood clots. So they're at higher risk of having these kind of complications. So, um, so those are the kind of problems that we're, that we're seeing right now. And, uh, and I'll tell you, after we've evaluated uh, the Johnson & Johnson, if they come back and say, you know, we think it's okay to start again, I would be comfortable uh, getting it again because I still think that the risk benefit ratio favors, you know, favors receiving the vaccine. I think that's really important. You brought up the comparison of that one in a million. And I think it's important to note too that you mentioned this is showing that these safety events are really working. And it should show you that this company is not trying to hide anything. They want to give you as much information as possible. You mentioned that there are certain things that people can look out for, for this specific type of blood clot. Um, what should people, specifically women, since that's who it's been affecting, look for after they get the vaccine? So if they have an unusual headache, um, shortness of breath and chest pain, or a swelling in their legs with one leg kind of more swollen than the other, or redness or tenderness. Those are the signs of blood clots. The blood clots that you know that have been identified to this point are actually blood clots that happen in one of the larger veins in the in the brain. And so, you know, headache is one of the things. Now, one of the important things about this is these blood clots aren't the typical kind of blood clots that people get. And actually the treatment is, is slightly different than what the way we would normally treat um, a blood clot. So it's important for us, for you to, uh, to you know, notify your doctor if you have those kind of symptoms and be evaluated. And we're learning, you know, the, we're, we're, we now know the right way to treat that. And I think just as a reminder to everyone, don't panic if you've received this vaccine. Uh, if you're fine and you haven't experienced any of those symptoms, I think it's important to note that this is such a small, rare percentage of people that have gotten these, uh, right. that the likelihood of you getting this is very slim. So don't panic yeah. if you've gotten the vaccine. I've definitely right. seen some people that are starting to worry a little bit and it shouldn't be a worry something. It should be great that you're getting this information. Yeah. Yeah, and the, um, truth is, the truth is, if there's going to be a problem, it'll be within the first three weeks after the mm -hmm. after the uh, the vaccination. And you know, if you're past that time, then great. And if you're in the middle of that time, the, the you know the odds are that you're going to be just fine. I want to talk about um, specifics around what the experts are recommending. You're also an expert, but yeah. the uh, different uh, health departments, the center, um, the CDC and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine around yeah. the vaccines. What recommendations do they have specifically around it? So everyone has come out um, after this pause happened, everyone has come out and issued new new uh, recommendations. 
everyone agrees that a pause is the right thing to do. And, you know, holding off on Johnson and Johnson right now is, is the appropriate thing. Both ACOG and the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine continue to recommend that the, that the mRNA based vaccines, the um, Moderna and the Pfizer be offered to uh, pregnant women because they're at higher risk of having a complication. And because we now have ongoing information that the that uh, there, it continues to be safe and now we know that there's an effective response at least with with respect to the number of antibodies so all of these national societies continue to to recommend that we offer this to patients now i'll tell you this um, that's what the national the national people are doing i got a call from my own daughter last week saying hey i'm signed up for the moderna and i'm you know in the first trimester of my pregnancy what should i do and so now I'm pausing. Now I'm the dad. I'm the grandpa, right? And I'm like, what do I do? I said, go get it. Go get it. You're going to be fine, right? I mean, that's that's my own that's my own recommendation to my own family is that it, that the, the safest thing to do is to get the vaccine, especially if you've especially if you uh, um, have you know risk factors. You mentioned this earlier, but can you just emphasize when's the best time to get the vaccine while you're pregnant? No, there isn't, there isn't anything that says there is a best time. There's nothing that says don't do it in the first trimester or the second or the third trimester. I actually think earlier in the pregnancy is better. It gives you a chance to develop the, the, the immune response and, that, and actually give more uh, protection to your, to your uh, baby. Um, so there is nothing that says that there's any time that you should or shouldn't do it. I think the best time is when, when you're offered that right i mean we're at the point now i i used to say I, you know last time we talked i was saying uh you know wait when when it's your turn you should be able to you should go ahead and do it and now you know it's it's available to everyone so uh, i don't think i'm not telling people to wait to any at any particular time the other question is if you've already given birth and now you're breastfeeding what are your recommendations for those people specifically? You've kind of uh, alluded to this earlier, but will you just give us a little bit more information about your thoughts on that? Yeah, I absolutely would recommend if you haven't received uh, if you haven't received the vaccine during your pregnancy, you should receive it before you before you uh, or leave the hospital. And the truth is, that's you know that's one of the strategies that Intermountain is using to make sure that everyone gets access to the vaccine. You know, they've set up these clinics, special clinics where you can come in and get vaccinated. We're trying to get ready to get it into out out into your own clinic where you're seeing your doctor. But you know at th that point at where you're in the hospital and being discharged is another time where it's a great time to get the vaccine. Get it while you're before you're discharged. It's not going to affect your breastfeeding. There's evidence that the that the antibody may actually pass to the baby. Now we don't know whether you know antibody that's that's taken into the GI system will be a, as effective as you know ones that are passed through the through the placenta um, but you know in other in other uh, illnesses other infections that that uh, passive immunity where you're receiving antibodies through the breast milk does make a big difference for babies so you know I, I think that's likely going to happen with COVID as well we also just got a question um, around COVID-19 vaccine potentially affecting people's menstrual cycle. The specific question was, there's been some reports saying that the vaccine has affected people's menstrual cycle and the University of Illinois is currently doing an online study about that. Do we know anything about any potential effects of the vaccine on this? And if so, are there any reports specifically in Utah? There, I'm not aware of any information that suggests that the that the uh, vaccine affects your menstrual menstrual cycle or even affects infertility. I mean, there's a lot of misinformation out there that gets picked up, started, and then it's it just blossoms and goes. And there really isn't any. I I, look, I went to the um, uh, Amer American Society of Reproductive Medicine, their website, and looked at their their all the things that they're saying. There is no evidence that the that the vaccine has any effect on infertility or the menstrual cycle that that we're aware of at this point. The interesting thing is when you get the vaccine, anything that happens, you think, oh, it's the vaccine that's causing it, and that's not. It's 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 uh, you know there you, there are there is no real um, evidence to support any of those concerns. I think the key there is correlation does not equal causation. There's, I've That's seen a lot of stuff around that. And it's important that if you do have a reaction or something happens, you report it to, I think it's uh, VARS is how you pronounce yeah. it, uh, the CDC system. So they can track it, but it shouldn't be this, this panic that you have a headache or something happens. 
uh, that it's automatically associated with the vaccine. So that's really good advice. You said that so eloquently. That was, I, <laughs> I, love, I, I love that you said that. It's because uh, a class I took talked about that a lot. It was a, a data class and it was a very big thing we talked about. So yeah, that's exactly um, is there anything else you'd like to talk about or mention to our viewers around women and the COVID-19 vaccine specifically? Uh, I'll just, I just want to be reassuring about this. Okay. I really feel like um, we're, 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 we're comfortable now taking care of pregnant women during this pandemic. I think people can say, look, I can have a safe pregnancy. Um, I, we need to continue, uh, masking, wearing, and, and you know, there's, there's a lot of, you're getting mixed messages because, you know, on the one hand, people want to open things up as quickly as possible, but we really just need to be careful and taking a little bit of extra caution, I think is, is, is going to be, is going to be the thing that gets us quickly to the point where we can open fully. So masking, social distancing, getting the vaccine, those things are all effective during pregnancy and you can have a, you can have a safe uh, pregnancy during this time. That's, that's the thing I would say. Last thing for you, because we just got this question again, and I just want to reassure people. Will you just talk about um, and reassure people around the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and if they should be worried or not if they've received it? Yeah, so again, there's the, the, the risk that, that kind of caused this pause is very um, small, right? It's one, one case out per million. Um, we're not even sure at this point that there's a causation there. They're stopping to look at the data and to kind of reevaluate. Um, if you, I'll tell you that a family member of mine got the Johnson and Johnson. And again, we're not, this is not something that we're, that we're concerned about. If you've, if you received the vaccine more than three weeks ago, you shouldn't have any problem. And if you received it recently, then monitoring for symptoms is, is the right thing. It's good to know that what you're looking for, again, it's headache, shortness of breath or chest pain, and then swelling in your legs. Um, if you have those symptoms, then you, then you, can, you can talk to your uh, physician or your nurse practitioner and they can evaluate you. Um, but uh, you know, the risk is very low. And I, I'm very reassured that our system is working. We've got a system where we're able to, uh, I'm amazed at how quickly we've been able to vaccinate so many people and keep track of you know, all the, the things that, that, uh, that you know, we should be watching for. And then to take a pause and be safe is the right thing to do. I have a few more questions for you. Sorry. <laughs> um, someone wants to know how we can help share this message to our pregnant friends, neighbors, sisters, and loved ones to get vaccine vaccinated. Are there OBGYNs having this discussion with them? What's the yeah. best way to talk about this with people? Honestly, the I think what you just said is exactly right. The best thing that you can do is encourage everyone to talk to their doctor or their midwife. And we've been we've been giving information, giving all this information to all the all the um, providers, to doctors, midwives, and I've been telling them, in every visit, you should this is, should be part of your visit to say, let's talk about COVID, let's talk about the vaccine, let's talk about questions that you might have, and and having them, you know, encourage uh, in, in, encourage people to make an informed decision, and that's the best way to do it. Your your doctor or your midwife knows your own medical conditions, knows you know, you and can help you make an informed choice. I think that's great advice. Dr. Esplin, thank you so much for joining us and having this discussion with us. And if anyone's watching would like to get an appointment for a COVID-19 vaccine, we release our new set of appointments at 8 a.m. every Friday. So next week's appointments are out right now. You can go to intermountain.com slash COVID-19 or COVID vaccine and you'll be able to fill out a quick uh, informational survey with all of your information and then select a location and time that works best for you. Again, thank you so much for joining us and we'll talk to you later. Thank you, bye-bye.